Hi, welcome to Session 5 of History 3380, World Civilizations. This is Part 1 of Session 5, and the entire session, Part 1 and 2, is going to be devoted to the rise of trading empires. What we've been doing so far in the course is to look at the world as it was, pre-modern civilizations, how they structured themselves in terms of social organizations, such as clientelage, uh, patron-client relations, and kin groups. We looked at uh, religion and how it could be both a challenge to existing institutions and beliefs, but it could also provide legitimacy for political institutions and states, as could ideologies, of course. And we've looked at the beginnings of economic change uh, from a pattern where there was almost exclusive dependence on agricultural production to gradually the development of longer distance trading routes. And then we looked at uh, some factors that were introducing change into this process in addition to the gradual development of long distance trade. That included climate change, the movement of nomadic peoples in part <coughs> triggered by that, and the spread of pandemic disease, which had a powerful impact on most of the world's civilizations, certainly by the middle of the 16th century, by 1550 or so, because of course by then pandemic diseases had spread to the Western Hemisphere. And one of the things that happened as a result of disease in Europe, in addition to the weakening of feudalism, which as we will see will help give way to capitalism later on, but in addition to that, it created a power vacuum in the Mediterranean. The city-states of Italy, like Genoa, Venice, which had dominated the trade of the Mediterranean and its politics in many ways, uh, were seriously weakened by the Black Death. And that's going to play an important part in this part of the story as we look at the rise of trading empires as two major ones will come to contend for control of the Mediterranean and its resources. But more importantly, what we're looking at with this session is the emergence of new, more powerful political and economic structures built partly on new technologies. And these will come to interconnect much of the world's population and rapidly change the way people live, the way they conduct their lives, and eventually impact the basic formations of economic activity as well as the ways people looked at themselves looked at the natural world. All of this a part of modernity and much of it stemming from these changes that occur with the rise of the trading empires. Now if we go to the first slide, as I said, one of the things that plays a role here is climate change. And we've seen this before because it played a role in the Black Death in terms of the drying of the climate that sent rats scurrying from northern Asia into the trade routes across the region. And, of course, the cooling of the climate also undermined agricultural production in Europe, causing famines and weakening the population and ultimately making them more susceptible to the spread of the plague when it arrived from the eastern Mediterranean in the 14th century. That cooling of the climate also impacted the relationships between nomadic and sedentary people as we've seen. And specifically, the impact that it had was that nomadic people became more active, became more aggressive, instead of simply conducting commercial exchanges with peasant populations, with sedentary civilizations, and occasionally warring on them. Now, nomadic populations began moving more aggressively, largely to secure additional pasturage. If the climate is drier, and it does become drier when the air cools, that creates problems for groups that rely on grazing of animals. Less rain means less greenage that can be used as feed for the animals, so you have to reach out into larger areas. That became part of a motivation for this aggressive strategy, not simply warring occasionally on sedentary populations to secure resources from them, you know, steal crops or whatever, but now to actually invade and occupy sedentary populations over a long period of time. 
And a number of the groups who rise to prominence in this era, around 1200, are part of this process. Most people who study European history know something about the Vikings, the Norsemen, and their raids throughout northern Europe. In addition to that, we have the rise of Islam, and this was driven to a considerable extent by nomadic populations that were moving out of the Arabian Peninsula and helping to spread the control of Islam into other regions of the world. They're part of the same process of nomadic people on the move and doing more than simply raiding other populations, but now actually asserting political con and military control over them. The Turks and the Mongols, we've already seen the Mongols, we're going to look at them again for a couple of minutes because of their importance, but also Turkish populations in South Central Asia, they come to play a role. They are nomads as well. They are going to move in, especially into the Middle East, but also into uh, the northern reaches of the Indian subcontinent. And again, all of these movements are characterized by the same change, that these people aren't there just to take crops or to seize treasure and then depart. Rather, they are creating permanent or at least semi-permanent semi political structures. They are creating the beginnings of the trading empires. Now, one of the important features of this process hmm, is one that we saw already when I talked about the Mongols entering China and how you know, the expression was created, well, you can conquer an empire on horseback, but you can't rule it from there. True. Hmm. You need different kinds of structures. But that doesn't mean that nomadic groups couldn't adapt hmm, to the realities of sedentary populations. Clearly, their kinds of governorship structures were much more loosely formed because they were nomadic. Hmm. Sedentary populations had more highly developed specialized institutions of government given the fact that they occupied areas for long periods of time. Groups of them settled into urban areas where you had the opportunity over long stretches, decades, centuries, to develop elaborate institutions, whether they're religious institutions, political institutions. Nomadic groups don't have that same opportunity. Chinese empire has its Mandarin class, its scholarly gentry, these professional bureaucrats. The Mongols obviously had nothing of the sort. But that didn't mean that the Mongols couldn't marry the two systems together, bring their own aggressive strategies assisted by their expert horsemanship, take those aggressive strategies and marry them to efficient bureaucratic administration. And this is what starts to happen in much of the world around 1200, is we have nomadic groups occupying regions dominated by sedentary populations, and we get a merging of the warfare skills of the nomadic groups with the bureaucratic skills of the sedentary populations. It isn't just China, we'll see it in places like India, we see it in Europe with the decline of the Roman Empire in succeeding centuries as nomadic groups move in and occupy lands that were at that time largely populated by sedentary people, peasant groups essentially we see this merging of two types of political administration. And what we get are essentially highly efficient war machines. States that are now very good at rapid military expansion, both because of the technologies they have, the expertise they have from the nomadic populations, and the expertise in bureaucratic administration coming from the sedentary populations. In addition, these skills were going to be married to new technologies. When I say new, by that I mean the widespread use of them, new in the fact that they are now widely adopted in many different parts of the world, including the compass, the astrolab, which is a basic instrument for determining one's position, particularly helpful if you're sailing, by shooting the stars, you're able to determine approximate position uh, on the seas by using this instrument. These were instruments that would make it possible for 
more long-distance movement to occur, whether it was for purposes of warfare or, of course, for purposes of trade. Other technologies that were developed, the rudder. Seems very basic, but the fact is, until you have a rudder, until you have a rudder system, which could be steered usually with um, a wheel, and it's more elaborate development, uh, the steerage of a boat is not very easy. I mean, most of the time, in the past, you were using oars, so when you wanted to go one direction versus the other, one group of oarsmen stopped, and the others continued rowing, just like you do in a little rowboat. You know, you let one oar go, and you use the other one to turn yourself. Well, that's kind of primitive. You get a rudder, you can do a lot. The lateen sail is simply a triangular sail. Uh, we most commonly see them um, in the original configuration in the Red Sea, uh, the Indian Ocean, uh, the famous dows of the region that have these graceful white sails that slant up along a mast and come down. Those are very different in appearance than the kind of sails typically associated with sailing vessels, for example, in Western Europe in the centuries leading up to about 1400, 1500. The difference is that the Latin sail, this triangular sail, is far more useful in ocean voyages for the simple reason that you take a square set sail and basically all you can do with it is put that ship, that boat, out in the water and let the wind blow behind the sail and send you someplace. The problem is maybe the wind's not blowing in the direction you want to go. <laughs> so you haven't got much choice. <laughs> you, know, you essentially have like a sheet hung up. The wind is blowing into it and pushing you along. But with a lateen sail, the sail is attached to a boom. So you can swing the sail, just as you see in any small sailboat out on a lake or the ocean today. And as you swing the boom, left, right, for our purposes, landlubber's purposes, rather port than starboard, the wind can catch the sail and push you in a different direction because you can maneuver the sail. You can't move the wind, but you can maneuver the sail and how the wind will strike it, and that allows you to move in different directions. This is an enormous advantage over the more clumsy, more difficult to maneuver square sails that were most common in the world before this time. Another development is the development of cannon uh, and their use for the purposes both of land-based warfare and warfare at sea. As we will note later on, the Ottoman Empire, for example, was able to expand to the extent that it did by its use of massive cannon. These cannon may be 20, 25 feet in length. They were enormous. In fact, in order to use them, the Ottomans would disassemble them, move them someplace, set them up, and then employ them as siege guns. In other words, when they were laying siege to an urban area, to a city with walls around it, they would set these artillery pieces up, as we would call them today, and use them to destroy the walls of the urban area. That's how big these kinds of cannon were. On the other hand, in the West, in Western Europe, much smaller cannon were employed almost from the beginning. And these were much more useful and adaptable to seafaring ventures because you can't really take a 25-foot cannon uh, and put it on a 45-foot boat and expect good things to happen. Uh, so the Ottomans actually had a disadvantage in terms of uh, warfare at sea because of the types of cannon they used. But in either case, this involves a massive increase in the ability to inflict damage, human and material, on your opponents. That means you have a new, more effective war technology which allows you to spread your influence and your control more rapidly. Another technology was the knowledge of ocean currents. If you're going to get around in the open sea before the invention of steam power for ocean-going vessels, you really needed to know where the ocean currents were what directions they flowed in, what course they took. When the Portuguese start exploring down the Atlantic coast of Africa, at first they have a very difficult time because the ocean current running along the 
immediate coast flows south, which was fine. As long as you wanted to go south, current would help carry you along with whatever prevailing winds there were. But when you turned around and decided to come back, you were now in serious trouble because even if the winds had shifted and were now blowing north, the ocean current wasn't going to shift. It was still running south. So now you had to fight the ocean current and the voyage could take two, three, four times as long going back as it did going out. Not a good thing. Only over time did the Portuguese discover that there were ocean currents further out at sea that ran north. So to return, you simply sail further out into the ocean, knowing where the current is, of course, pick up the current, and now you have a reasonably fast voyage back to your home port. This kind of knowledge was absolutely critical to the economic expansion and the military expansion that was occurring at this time as these civilizations acquired this information. This became critical information. It would be considered high security, top secret information today. The relative handful of pilots, the people responsible essentially for navigating the ships, because the captains really weren't responsible for that, pilots had to keep this information close to their chest. It was usually information that they had acquired directly or from family members, from relatives, and the information was never to be shared with outsiders because, of course, first of all, it destroyed your career <laughs> since others could share. And if it got into the hands of another empire, of course, it gave them the opportunity to access the same areas that you were trying to exploit for trade. Uh, this kind of battle is going to go on, for example, among the European trading empires as they enter the Indian Ocean, each of them contending with each other. Uh, the Dutch would, for example, steal much of this information. Well, not steal it, but let's say acquire it. From the Portuguese, it will allow them to rapidly expand their interests in the Indian Ocean at the expense of the Portuguese because of the knowledge that they acquired that had originally been acquired by the Portuguese. So all of these technologies become critical. What's also happening here as these empires emerge is that we have a marriage between the idea of military expansion and the idea of commercial expansion. These empires, whether we're talking about the Ottomans or uh, the Mughal Empire in India, and we'll talk about them, they all expanded overland and they all acquired additional territories with new peoples and of course as would be typical of past empires they would impose tribute payments on these new peasant populations to further enhance their resources and their revenues but what was distinctive about this new set of empires is that while they were doing that they were also intent upon expanding commercial connections particularly ocean-going commercial connections and this was so important to them because as I mentioned early on in the course long-distance commerce could bring tremendous returns, high profits, and that that meant for the states that could secure control of these long-distance trade routes that they could rapidly enhance their revenues. And as they enhanced their revenues, they could then acquire more material goods, specifically more military technologies, and further expand. The Ottomans, for example, the cannon that they used to decimate the walls of enemy cities they were acquiring in Sweden. <laughs> they had the revenues to purchase these powerful cannon from long distance traders and in that way expand. So the initial technologies allow for commercial expansion which gives higher profits which allows for greater military expansion because you can acquire more weapons and improved weapons. Now as far as the new empires and what they are, one we've already looked at to a certain extent, the creation of the Mongol Empire in China. This empire was one that would not follow quite the same pattern as the others. Hmm? Under Mongol rule, yes, there was this vast expansion, particularly overland, from China all the way to Eastern Europe. But when Mongol rule came to an end in a little over a century, China was no longer going to be the same kind of aggressive imperial power as the other trading empires that were now rising to prominence, like the Ottomans, like Spain, like the Mughal Empire. So 
the Mongol invasion of China sort of created the prototype for the other empires. But then China itself, after about 100 years, although it remained a very powerful, the most powerful empire, would retreat from this aggressive expansionism that marked the other systems. The Mameluke Empire in Egypt in 1260 was another one of these empires created by nomadic peoples, came to dominate what we would consider much of the Nile Valley in this period in the late 13th century. However, it also had a tremendous rival in the Ottoman Empire that developed in what is now modern-day Turkey, and we'll look at a map in a little while and see where all of this is located. Uh, that would be the principal rival of the Mamluks, and they would eventually fall under the control of the Ottomans. But again, all of these empires following this pattern. Uh, in Western Europe, Spain and Portugal. They're really warrior states. They were created as a result of long-term warfare by Christian princes against the Islamic societies that had been created in the Iberian Peninsula. So they too are part of this same process of uh, warrior societies invading sedentary populations, taking them over, and then using that as a basis for creating long distance trading networks that form these early modern trading empires. So these are typical examples of when we're talking about trading empires. There are others to come. These are some of the earliest ones. Uh, they were typical of this merging of nomadic peoples, sedentary populations, new technologies, and the increasing control over long distance trade routes that allowed them to rapidly increase their revenues. This is what was going to distinguish them so much from the ancient empires, which were powerful in their own right, but had not nearly the expansionist power and capability of these new empires, which were built far more than ever before on the profits from trade. Agriculture and agricultural tribute, yes, remains essential underpinning for all these empires, but the thing that really allows them rapid expansion is control of long distance trade. Now, again, this process occurs largely as the result of nomadic populations. In Eastern Asia, we see the invasion of the Mongols into China and the creation of the vast Mongol Empire. In Western Asia, various Turkish tribes, and this is a linguistic distinction when we talk about Turkish groups, uh, came to dominate much of what was South Central Asia and much of the Middle East particularly the Seljuk Turks. Uh, if you look at modern-day Iran, Iraq, Syria, the Seljuk Turks, one tribal group within the larger, larger Turkish population, came to dominate much of the region of the modern Middle East. They, in turn, were overrun by the Mongols in the 1200s. So not only do we have nomadic peoples invading sedentary populations, but we also have nomadic peoples taking each other on and removing the less efficient, the less powerful warrior states that are created. So this is a period of tremendous turmoil that's going on across much of the world, whether we're talking Western Europe, the Middle East, uh, the Indian subcontinent, China, all over we have enormous movements of people, of armies, although we might not call them armies in the modern sense, uh, tremendous disruption, the toppling of states, not only sedentary states, but even like the Mameluke Empire, which is one of the warrior states, it finally falls victim to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this is a period of enormous turmoil and change, but what it's giving birth to are these long-term, extremely powerful trading empires. Now, as I said at the beginning, one of the critical examples of the emergence of the trading empires comes in the Mediterranean and is largely the, well, is partly the product of the Black Death, the plague, because of its weakening of the Italian city states. If we go just a further slide. Here is the Mediterranean. And over here, 
the outlines of the Ottoman Empire. As I run the cursor around, this is all the Ottoman Empire. This would be the Balkans today. Modern day Turkey down here would have areas like Lebanon and of course Egypt on into North Africa towards Morocco. This entire region, most of the Eastern Mediterranean, and this would be talking around, oh, the year 1500. Uh, this entire region is controlled by the Ottoman Empire, whose origins, and we'll look at its origins, lay back here in what is now modern-day Turkey. And we're going to look at the other contender for power, which is uh, essentially the Spanish Empire, although we'll see that the Spanish Empire was more than just Spain because the descendants of this dynastic system controlled not only Spain here, but also the Holy Roman Empire, a loose collection of states in what is now modern-day Germany, modern-day Austria, and this same king or queen, depending on the ruler, also controlled portions of Italy. So we have one very diverse empire over here in terms of a dynasty that has tied a number of different principalities together, and it controls Spain and the Holy Roman Empire and parts of Italy. And then we have the Ottoman Empire over here with its own massive land mass controlling much of the eastern Mediterranean and parts of northern Africa. But the critical area is not so much the land mass for these people as it would have been in past centuries for ancient empires, but the water in between, the Mediterranean Sea. Because the Mediterranean provides a marvelous trade route. Again, the simple economics is you can move goods over water much more cheaply than you can move them over land. Here, this entire region is a natural hotbed of commercial activity because people can move goods easily from one part of the region, let us say, and when I say the region, I mean the whole Mediterranean region, uh, from Spain all the way to Constantinople over here, you can take them by water, being much, much cheaper and much easier than going over all the mountains, the terrain, separating these two areas. Here it's very easy. So this was a, a natural market, if you will, a natural economic zone because the Mediterranean Sea tied it together. Furthermore, the importance of the Mediterranean was growing because people were beginning to develop the technologies I just talked about. Back in the days of the Romans, five, six centuries before the period we're talking about, 1200 and on, people crept along the shores of the Mediterranean. You didn't sail from, let's say, Valencia in Spain to Constantinople, simply going across the Mediterranean. You wouldn't dare. Huh? There'd be far too much danger from storms, from getting lost, not knowing your correct position. But as time goes on, now even by 1500, people didn't take a single straight voyage. What they would do is they would stop, let us say, uh, in Sardinia, they would stop perhaps in Sicily, perhaps Crete. You'd do it in a series of steps because still people didn't want to take really long, long voyages. Uh, there's still some fragility to the system in terms of the quality of the ship itself and also your abilities at navigation. So it's done in steps, but still, unlike the past where people would simply crawl along the shore because they were afraid to sail directly across the Mediterranean. Now they are moving directly across, it's just that they're using a series of stepping stones along the way. So this means trade is going to start moving a lot faster. Now people are going to be shipping goods from one end of the Mediterranean to the other with relative rapidity. And this means that control of this area, control of this sea, is absolutely critical to two emerging trading empires. Spain or the Habsburgs on the one hand and the Ottomans on the other. The question was who was going to dominate, who was going to reap the enormous benefits of controlling all of the trade in the Mediterranean. And that issue came to prominence after the Black Death because, uh, you probably can't see it here except I've got the cursor pointed at it, because of cities like Genoa, uh, they had long dominated Mediterranean trade. But now 
when the Black Death devastated them and they were the first urban areas to suffer the blows of the Black Death and they suffered repeated waves of plague, as their power was decreased, it wasn't that it was eliminated because they remained significant players, but not with the same kind of power and control that they once had. As that occurred, this vacuum is created, this opportunity is created for someone else to emerge as the dominant force. Yeah, okay. So, with the decline of Venice and Genoa, we see a power vacuum that now two trading empires are going to try to fill. Something that's going to play a role here is not only the simple economic motivations, but also religious considerations. Hmm. Remember, the Ottoman Empire is an Islamic empire. <coughs> Spain is a Christian empire. Hmm. And this creates conflict between these two systems as much as the economic competition. Both sides, both Europeans and Turks, Arabs, have used religious inspiration as a part of an ideology that justified expansion. So inevitably, since each side saw in religion a justification for its expansion, religion was also going to be an issue of conflict between the two sides in addition to the simple fight over markets and control of trade routes. Another reason for this is a very different view from the two perspectives on political legitimacy. Earlier in the course I was talking about how religions could provide legitimacy for state systems, saying that the divine powers had sanctioned whatever system existed. And this was true for both Spain and for the Ottoman Empire. But in general, Christian and Islamic rulers had a very different perspective on what this meant exactly. For Christian rulers, and here we again see the influence of the Christian church and the papacy, they relied on the imprimata, the approval, the stamp of approval of the Pope and of the Christian Church. But what that specifically meant for them was not just that they be Christian, but that they do everything in their power to ensure that all of their subjects were Christians. This is why over time uh, the Spanish crown, for example, would either force its Islamic and Jewish subjects to convert or it would expel them and it would persecute those who tried to practice religions other than Christianity. And this was common practice in the West because it was believed that if a Christian monarch was to have legitimacy, he had to do everything possible to ensure that his subjects were all Christians. Now, in Islamic empires, like the Ottoman Empire, religion, again, is motivation for expansion and there is seen an obligation to spread Islam. But in the process of conquest, it is not seen as essential for the legitimacy of the ruler to ensure that after the conquest, everyone is converted to Islam. In fact, as we will see, the Ottomans made considerable exceptions to that possibility without any threat to their legitimacy. It was not as if they were failing to be good Islamic rulers because they didn't force everyone to become Christians. There was a very practical reason, as we will see, why they wouldn't do that. But in any case, there's two very different views of legitimacy. If you're a Christian prince, you have to make everybody a Christian, otherwise you're not really a legitimate Christian prince. If you're an Islamic prince, yeah, yeah, you also have to work to expand the influence and control of your religion, but it doesn't mean you feel compelled to convert everyone in the population. But what would also happen, almost inevitably, it would mean that, of course, the actions of the Spanish monarch to persecute or expel members of the Islamic faith, to expel Muslims, would be seen as a horrendous crime by the Ottoman sultans and by other Islamic rulers. Now, another factor that enters into what's going on in this period is, of course, 
the unstable weather conditions that occurred in this region and in the world with the cooling of the climate. And the importance of that, of course, is the contribution to the spread of the Black Death, that it spread famine and made it possible for the Black Death to spread rapidly. And it disrupted state systems, for our purposes in particular, the Italian city-states. It weakened them. didn't destroy them, but it weakened them. It created disruption. The old structure was, well, Genoa, Venice, they were the kinds of city-states that tended to be the most influential powers in the Mediterranean, especially the eastern half of the Mediterranean. Well, that's no longer the case. Uh, the Black Death has seen to it that their power has been weakened, and now other states will have a chance to intervene. That power vacuum is what helps create the opportunities for these new trading empires. And again, we see the map. We've just talked about the significance of the Mediterranean. And we see that for the Ottomans, they are going to have essentially control of the East. The Spanish are the Habsburgs, the West. Yeah. Just a good question. Is the effect of weather, is it only, the only bad, negative effect of weather was that it, uh, uh, so, excuse me, that it uh, messed up the food stock, the crops, and, or was there any other negative effects besides that? Um, food shortages would be the primary effect. Uh, drier climates in general, that would also, uh, but it would also be affecting the, the uh, food uh, because of pasturage shortages. So, yeah, most, the most significant effect for us would be that in terms of what happens to human populations is food shortages. So here we have this increasingly valuable set of trade routes that the Mediterranean Sea comprised. And now control over them is up for grabs. The contenders. We can talk about Spain, and I'll refer to the Western power as either Spain or the Habsburg Empire. The Habsburgs were the rulers, and we'll see how they came into power. Most commonly, the empire was seen as the empire of Spain, but in fact, it is the dynastic family, the Habsburgs, who control this empire, and as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't consist just of Spain alone. Uh, to look at its origins, uh, we go back and look at Spain and a story that most people know because we know something about Columbus and his early voyages, and that is that in Spain, two, the two leading warrior states that had helped seize control of the Iberian Peninsula, that's where Spain's located, if we go back here, okay, here's the Iberian Peninsula, including Spain and Portugal. The two leading warrior states on the peninsula were Castile and Aragon, and they joined together as a single state with the marriage of the two heirs to these kingdoms, Isabella and Ferdinand. Ferdinand and Isabella married in 1469. They're the ones that give Columbus the okay to sail off because by now they rule a fairly significant state, the unified kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, which we most commonly refer to as Spain. Uh, this marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella was important beyond the simple fact that, okay, this is how Spain gets formed. It's basically how political states were formed in Europe in the early modern period. The idea was that as a king or a queen, you owned your kingdom. Just like you'd say, well, I own my house. Well, you really don't. Usually the bank owns it. <laughs> You're just paying them for it. Uh, but it would be your property my home. So if I want to sell it to somebody, I can sell it to somebody. And if I die, of course, the assumption would be that my heirs would inherit my home and be able to use it as they so chose. Well, that's how rulership and that's how kingdoms, political entities, states were viewed in Europe in this period. What that meant was that to build a more powerful state, you married somebody who was the heir to another powerful state and you merge the two together. So this became the basic uh, dynastic politics of the era. This is unlike what you see elsewhere, let's say, in the Ottoman Empire, etc. You don't go around marrying people uh, for the purposes of joining 
systems together. But this view of uh, kingship or rulership as an inheritable property is what allowed the ruling class, the elite of Europe, to do precisely this. And it becomes very important because this is how Spain winds up being the Habsburg Empire. At this time, after the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella, there is another dynastic power, somewhat to the uh, east of them, over here in Austria, the Habsburgs. Okay, They are a dynastic family as well. More importantly, although that slice didn't look very big when you look at Austria, the fact is they were the heirs to the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. They were the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs, the Holy Roman Empire seen up here. Now, again, this was a creation that goes back. We, look at the, we looked at the Frankish state and its relationship to the papacy and the creation of the Holy Roman Empire. Well, by this time, by the 1400s, the Holy Roman Empire is a loose collection of German principalities, essentially. Uh, it's not like the Holy Roman Emperor really has absolute control over all of these small principalities. What he's able to do is, uh, he, well, he basically has to work with them and get their cooperation. Uh, it does give him access to considerable resources, but he doesn't have the kind of absolute control that, say, the King of Spain or the Ottoman Sultan or the um, Emperor of China would have. He has to work in coordination with a multiplicity of small states that technically constitute the Holy Roman Empire. But still, it's a lot of people. It's potentially a lot of revenue. What's going to happen now is that Ferdinand and Isabella are going to merge their interests with the Habsburgs and gain control of the Holy Roman Empire, parts of Italy, by marrying their heir to the heir of the Habsburgs. And this, again, was the way it was done. This is how dynastic politics worked in Europe in the early modern era. Now, the lucky couple were Juana, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, and Philip of Habsburg. Now, as you can imagine, these marriages uh, were not love matches. I mean, chances were likely that when these marriages occurred, the lucky couple had never even met each other until just before the wedding. And God knows <laughs> how those meetings went. And I find out, my God, <laughs> this guy's 30 years older than I am, <laughs> and he's half blind. Um, in this case, actually, the defect was more on Juana's side. Uh, she was suffering from some type of serious mental illness. Exactly what, we don't know. She was given to fits, and uh, she was known as Crazy Juana. Uh, <laughs> Juana la loca. Um, uh, but, of course, that never stopped <laughs> any well-meaning parent from marrying one of their children off. <laughs> she's a lovely girl, <laughs> when she's not foaming at the mouth. Uh, <laughs> So, this marriage, again, for practical purposes, brought together the heirs to these two empires, Spain and the Habsburg Empire, an enormous accumulation of territory. Spain, the German states, parts of Italy, huge production. And despite one of problems, the son that she and Philip produced uh, would come to be the figure who would con truly consolidate these various dynastic holdings into a single empire. They would still be, he'd still face major challenges, particularly from the Holy Roman Empire, but for the, the heir of these two young people, he became the recognized emperor dominating Western Europe at this time. And that was Charles V. Charles would be the one who would contend most directly with the Ottoman sultans for control of the Mediterranean during the 1500s. Now, Charles had an enormous task ahead of him. He had this multinational empire, Spain, the German states, parts of Italy, the Netherlands, well, they were thrown into the mix as well. 
And again, how are they connected? I mean, these people speak all different languages. Hmm. They have often significantly different cultural heritages. The only connection between all of them is the fact that they were part of one dynastic system or another that now through intermarriage has been brought into a single political entity. So it's a huge challenge. Now you've got to speak Italian, you've got to speak German, you've got to speak Spanish, just a linguistic bit alone. And of course the way you rule Spain, where you have much more direct control, is vastly different than the way you're trying to rule the Holy em Roman Empire, where the power of the emperor is much more limited. So he has this enormous task, but he has considerable resources at his command. Hmm. You remember, Columbus got to the New World, Pizarro and Cortes had conquered two powerful empires and found enormous wealth in the silver mines of the Western Hemisphere that was now pouring into the coffers of Charles V. In addition, there were the extraordinarily valuable trade routes across the Mediterranean. Not only was it a matter of the economies directly located on the Mediterranean itself, but of course there were resources coming up from Africa, there were resources coming across Asia, feeding into this same huge marketplace. So control of the Mediterranean would further enhance the considerable resources Charles already had coming from the New World. But he had to also face the fact that unlike the New World where after the conquest of Spain and, Portu uh, Spain and Portugal, after the conquest of the Aztec and Inca empires, it'll be over a century, really a century and a half before Spain will face a serious threat in the New World from other European powers. So it's got considerable breathing space there. The Spanish maintained, and we'll look at Spain more closely in the New World later, but it maintained a relatively small military presence in the New World. Didn't have to worry about it. There was nobody there to attack them. But in the Mediterranean, one of the most powerful empires in the world is emerging at the other end of the Mediterranean, and they really don't want to see the Spanish or the Habsburgs take over the entire trading network. And that, of course, is the Ottomans. The Ottomans are, again, a warrior state created by the activities of nomadic people. The Turks who helped create the Ottoman Empire originally entered the region serving as mercenaries, if you will, as professional soldiers for the various warring states in the region, in the Eastern Mediterranean. By 1354, they had not only formed their own state, but they were expanding significantly, invading the Balkans. Here we go back to our map for a second. They start out here in what's generally called Anatolia, uh, where they had formed this state about 1300, and now they're moving up into this region, into the Balkans. Hmm. So they're getting off to a pretty fast start, even by the middle of the 14th century, or in other words, 1354. But, just as things were really starting to go swimmingly, uh, they faced attack from their rear, if you will, hmm. in a Mongol conqueror named Timurlane, who was considered one of the fiercest, most violent rulers in early modern history. There are numerous eyewitness accounts of Timurlane and what he would do after conquering a city of 20, 30,000 people. He'd slaughter everybody in the city, uh, have their heads cut off and pile all their heads into a huge mound just to show off 
<laughs> See what I can do? Uh, mostly probably to intimidate surrounding states and cities so they decide that they want to surrender rather than resist Timurlane. But he was an extraordinarily fierce warrior and he attacked the Ottoman Empire and overran it temporarily. So he, after this fast start, the Ottomans have this huge setback when they're invaded and conquered by Timurlane uh, and he sacks Ankara, which is essentially their capital at this time in Anatolia, in 1402. Up to this time, the Ottomans, although they'd formed a state, were still a bit like the Mongols before they began occupying China and forming a more stable state organization. And that is, they were essentially nomads. They were just moving from one conquest to another. But they didn't really have, and they were relying on, uh, as the Mongols did initially, tribal alliances. That's how the whole system worked. You know, you, get, you become uh, the most powerful, the most feared tribal leader among the Turks. Uh, the other tribal leaders agree to follow you. You go off and invade and sack places and take the money. It's all very loosely organized. Okay? There's nothing intended to create a truly stable, well-organized and managed state. That changed after Timurlane. The Turks certainly must have realized that if they were to survive in the future and not fall once again uh, to future invasion, that they would have to be better organized. And that is precisely what their ruler, Murad, managed to do beginning in 1421. Murad II creates a new kind of empire, a much more stable and organized system. Most important was the Janissary Corps. We talked about the Chinese Empire and its training of bureaucrats, the scholarly gentry. What the Ottomans created wasn't quite on that level, but it was a major advance over the kinds of loose organizations that they had had previously as nomadic warriors, and certainly a considerable step above how other states were ruled at this time. Generally speaking, and if you look at Western Europe again as a good example, if you want a sharp contrast with what the Chinese were doing, well, the Chinese had this very organized, professionally trained a bureaucracy that's created around the empire. In the European states, generally jobs went to people uh, who were members of landowning families, members of the elite. Uh, by 1500, if not much earlier, uh, jobs, positions in the bureaucracy were being sold in places like Spain. You bought the job. Uh, you didn't get any money for it, so you're expected to get bribes. <laughs> Uh, in order to make the job a, a paying proposition. So there was a good deal of uh, favoritism, patronage being passed out, positions being sold. But with the Ottomans, well, they didn't create quite the sort of centrally trained bureaucracy. They did set up what was called the Janissary Corps. Now, these were young males taken from their families at an early age and sent to be trained at the Ottoman court. Now, they were taken from non-Muslim families. Why? Because they didn't want these people being involved in the politics of an Islamic state. Smart move. Hmm. So that's why they would draw on the non-Muslim population. Hmm. The other thing that they did was that they made these young people slaves. Now, when you say, use the term slave, people say, oh, God, <laughs> so awful. You know, in chains and being whipped. But that wasn't what the term slave meant in this case. What it meant was, and the reason that the Ottoman sultans declared the members of the Janissary Corps to be slaves, is that as a slave, you were not subject to Islamic law. So, that means you didn't enjoy the protections of Islamic law. That means if you did something wrong, you didn't have the right to go before an Islamic court and be judged. 
Specifically, what the Sultan was interested in is that if you do something that I think is a threat to me, I can just throw you in prison, I kid you. Hmm. Okay. We don't have to mess around with an Islamic court. Hmm. And that's why they were delegated or designated as slaves, so that they would be outside the Islamic legal system, and as a result, the Sultan would have total control over them. Now, the training of these young people was focused in two directions. Uh, to some extent, there was training for them to serve as administrators, and there there would be some similarity uh, to the system in China, although here there was not nearly the effort to create you know, thoroughly trained bureaucrats. Generally, there is common training for all of these young people, basic literacy, mathematics, with the focus as they mature into young adults on military training. For those who are considered less suitable for the military, they are designated for assignment in some type of civil bureaucratic position. So unlike China where there's a specific course to train everyone as a civil bureaucrat with multiple responsibilities, here they're basically being trained for military purposes, but some of them who are less adept at military activity will become civil uh, bureaucracies, or compose the civil bureaucracy. Uh, what it also meant is that the Ottoman Empire now had a professional army, a 24-7 professional army, because that's what the Janissary Corps creates. And members of the Janissary Corps might be generals, they might be foot soldiers, but they'd all come through this common pattern of training. And this would give the Ottomans an enormous advantage over time. Most other systems, including in the West and including other empires that surrounded the Ottomans, generally relied on a system not unlike the feudal order of Europe, which means, well, you know, there are a few soldiers around guarding whoever the king, the prince, the queen, but when it comes to warfare, you have to secure an army by calling on uh, local landowners, local members of the nobility, tribes, the chiefs of tribes, etc., uh, to secure troops and bring them in to form this army. So, quite frankly, it's kind of like calling up the reserves in the United States, and, but even on a more sort of informal fashion. The Ottomans, on the other hand, didn't have to worry about that. Didn't have to worry about, well, gee, are all these guys trained the same way? Do they use the same weapons? Do they all know, you know that we have this kind of formation? This is the kind of formation we march in? <laughs> Who knows, because they're coming from all different um, areas of your empire, and their loyalty is really more to their own lord or tribal chief than it is to you. But here, the Ottomans have a professional army, ready all the time to go after anybody and everyone. Now, there is an incentive for the military leaders as well. A critical part of the way the empire works is the collection of tribute. And as conquests were made, the conquering generals would be assigned what were called timars. These were units of administration and tribute collection. So let's say you conquer a province in the Balkans. Hmm. You, as the general, are then given that province to govern, to administer, and you collect the tribute. You keep part of it for yourself, and the rest goes on to the sultan. So this gives you a real incentive. It's not, well, I'm conquering for the greater glory of the Ottoman Empire. You're also conquering because it's going to line your pockets because you get to administer the province in the future. Hmm. Now, not all conquered territories were necessarily distributed to the military because in order to co-opt local elites, in other words, to get local rulers to cooperate with the empire, they were often left in charge or given control over Timars as well. In fact, this was a good way to negotiate rather than fight. Now, you're marching into a province, well, instead of having to fight the local prince and his army, you say to him, look, you swear loyalty to the Ottoman Sultan, you can now collect tribute as you have in the past, it's just that you have to share it with the Ottoman Sultan. So not all of them went to 
the Ottoman conquerors, some of them were given to local elites as a way of integrating them into the larger imperial structure. Now, all of this, of course, would help provide tax collections and revenues from peasant populations as the Ottomans expanded. But a critical part of what they were doing as well was controlling and taxing trade. If we go back to the map again for a second, here are the Ottomans here on the eastern Mediterranean. But over to the east are the Silk Roads running from China all the way into this region. Down here are valuable trade routes coming from Africa. Over here are the Europeans anxious to trade with Asia as well. So, and there are trade routes coming down, fur trade coming from uh, what is now Russia, Sweden, coming down this way. This is how the Ottomans got their cannon. So they have trade routes intersecting from north, south, east, and west right in this area, the eastern Mediterranean. So as they expand their control, they're also gaining control of these land-based trade routes. Now, of course, the big challenge is to expand beyond that and take over the entire Mediterranean. So this is very much an empire that links together both traditional conquest of peasant populations and collection of tribute with the expansion of trade. The critical factor will be, can you move beyond the trade routes that are coming in overland and extend your control not only through the eastern Mediterranean, but into the western Mediterranean as well. One of the most valuable trades that the Ottomans are rapidly getting control of is the spice trade. Spices, and we're going to look at this a little bit more later on, are coming from the far Pacific and the far reaches of the Indian Ocean from what are known as the Spice Islands, which really, if you think of the Indonesian archipelago, those are the Spice Islands. When I was talking about uh, the Malay pen, uh, Peninsula and the Malay Straits, we were looking at early trade, that's where the Spice Islands are located. Those spices are being shipped all the way across the Indian Ocean, across the Indian subcontinent, into the uh, Arabian Peninsula, and coming into the Ottoman Empire. Incredibly valuable product now its movement into the eastern Mediterranean controlled by the Ottomans. The Ottomans promoted private enterprise. They were not there for the most part to directly control the trade. Rather, what they wanted to do was simply tax the merchants. That was the ideal for them. We will see elsewhere where you know, trading empires seek to create state-controlled monopolies. Uh, the Ottomans really weren't focused on that. What they were focused on, control the route the territory where the route is, and then you can tax the merchants who come into that with their products. So early advocates of private enterprise. Now, as far as their governance of their populations, they looked upon Christians and Jews as groups with which they had a certain affinity, people of the book. The Bible for them was an important part of religious tradition. Moses, Jesus were earlier prophets prior to Muhammad. So they have reason not to treat these populations cruelly, but rather to accommodate Part of the reason, again, is religiously inspired. That they are, they do see themselves, Muslims see themselves as part of this religious tradition that includes Judaism and Christianity. There's also a practical reason. In many of the areas that they conquered, particularly in the Middle East itself, Christians and Jews formed important merchant and artisan communities. They were skilled craftsmen and traders. Hmm. You don't really want to eliminate these people or persecute them, aside from religious factors, for practical reasons. One of the things that Spain did that basically amounted to shooting itself in the head 
was persecuting and driving out Jews and Muslims. They were often the intellectuals. They were often skilled craftsmen, many of them merchants. You persecute those populations because you feel you need to as a legitimate Christian ruler, and you're really depriving yourself of enormous human resources. So there were both religious but also practical considerations in the way the Ottomans treated their population. To deal with these situations, they created what was known as the Millet system. This allowed local non-Muslim communities to govern themselves according to their own rules and cultural practices. So you may have, for example, a Jewish community, a Christian community. Uh, essentially, they had to abide, of course, by the Islamic law that governed the larger society, but in terms of, let us say, marriage rituals, etc., cetera, um, those practices and other local customs in terms of relationships between men and women and uh, basic civil law, uh, that would be left to the local community to continue governing itself as it had in the past. They had to obey the larger laws that governed the entire society. And of course, they had to pay tribute uh, to the Ottoman Sultan. But other than that, they could work as they chose. Now, as these two great empires, the Habsburgs on the one side in the Western Mediterranean, the Ottomans in the Eastern Mediterranean, engage battle. The Ottomans certainly seem to have an enormous advantage. And that is that at a time of war, the Ottoman Sultan can pull together an army of about 50,000, which is enormous by the standards of the early modern world. The Habsburg ruler, who would rely particularly on armies in Spain, especially in Castile, could put together an army of about 15,000, a land-based army. So when it came to land-based conflict, the Ottomans had a considerable advantage. But much of the contest for the Mediterranean is on the water. The key strategic locations are islands, port cities. The Ottomans could readily lay siege to large urban areas with their huge cannon. The Europeans, on the other hand, had relied on small field pieces that were much more adaptable to ocean-going vessels. So the Ottomans actually found themselves at a disadvantage, even though in numbers, in terms of efficiency of administration, they had the huge advantage. But the Europeans had certain advantages in terms of the technologies they used on board ship, especially the use of cannon. That meant the contest was going to be virtually a draw militarily, at least when it came to sea battles. Hmm. Now, as the relationships begin to develop in the Mediterranean, as the Ottomans grow more powerful, they rely, and so do the Spanish, on those Italian city-states that knew so much about the trade of the Mediterranean that had developed powerful merchant houses that helped finance the trade. So both Genoa and Venice became critical to this contest because both of them provided indispensable services to both of the contending powers. They still had a great deal of knowledge, capital that they could use in trade in the Mediterranean. So each of them were important in this contest between the two sides. Genoa came to be the favored ally of the Ottomans. They, recognizing that they were not going to be able to challenge the Ottomans, made an alliance and essentially served as their mercantile agents in the Eastern Mediterranean. Venice, after trying to challenge the Ottomans at sea, and you can understand given the certain advantages that Western Europeans had in terms of maritime technology, why Venice, even though it was a single city state versus a vast empire, might think that they could beat the Ottomans who had disadvantages at sea. Uh, Venice, 
when it realized it wasn't going to be able to defeat the Ottomans or even successfully fend them off, would choose to ally with the Mamluk Empire, which is back along the Nile River. Let's see if we can go all the way back for a second. Down here, Egypt, this is where the Mamluks are, and this is where the Venetians are going to ally themselves because, again, what can the Mamluks do for them? In particular, they can provide them with access to the spice trade, which is coming up not only on the Arabian Peninsula, but through the Red Sea towards Egypt. However, in 1517, the Ottomans invaded the Mamluk Empire hmm. and conquered it. And suddenly Venice uh, <laughs> had a big problem because now they have no ally. Hmm. The Ottomans also began spreading their power across North Africa, moving relentlessly across the northern Mediterranean coast of Africa towards the western Mediterranean. And now that they have essentially come to dominate both Genoa and Venice in terms of their military and economic power, the Ottomans increasingly are coming to monopolize the trade, especially the spice trade, and are excluding Western European powers from ready access to that trade. The realization of the growing power of the Ottomans is one of the reasons that the Spanish had gone looking across the Atlantic to get to Asia. Hmm all the way back in 1492. Now, by 1517, that's becoming a reality, that they are being shut off from the trade in spices in the Eastern Mediterranean because of growing Ottoman power. For the next 20 years, after 1517, and beyond this, but basically for two decades, the Spanish, the Habsburgs, and the Ottomans would throw themselves at each other in massive naval battles and land battles, but particularly naval battles, in the Mediterranean, each seeking ultimate conquest of the other side in order to dominate the trade routes of this region and, of course, for the Spanish, the Habsburgs, to gain access to those valuable trade routes in Asia. The end result of 20 years of massive naval warfare was a draw. <laughs> Neither side won. <laughs> Just to make it quick. <laughs> Instead of, well, I'm going to tell you about the Battle of Lepanto and this battle. It came down to, after 20 years, the Mediterranean was the Ottomans got the east, the Habsburgs got the west. It was a draw. <laughs> But what that meant also was that there was even further incentive for Western European powers to look elsewhere in the world to gain access to Asia. They had already begun doing that. The Spanish, as we've seen, sailed across the Atlantic. They found the New World. They found great wealth, but they didn't find Asia at that point. The Portuguese, even earlier, had started down the west coast of Africa, and they eventually would reach the Pacific, as would the Spanish, taking a more circuitous route. They would be followed by the British, the Dutch, French, all of them seeking to circumvent the Ottoman monopoly and gain access to the spices and other valuable goods of Asia. So the wars among the great trading empires had just begun. Soon the battle would take on global proportions as these new massive states seek to reach out and control the world's trade routes. We'll look at all of that and how it evolved in part two, session five. Thanks.